So it's all you, Cecile. Thank you, darling. A am I on? Thank you so much. Um, I always get a little nervous, even though I've been up in front of people before. But I do have to say that um, I am not uh, the uh, final word on Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I've just learned so much about her that I didn't know when I read this book. For those of you that are interested, it's called The Notorious RBG. And to start it off, um, as I think most of us, or some of us know, she was an opera aficionado, to say the very least. And um, along with Mr. Scalia, even though they were on opposite ends of the political pole, they could come together because they had this commonality, which I think <coughs> is just indicative of who she really is. And so I would like to play for you a brief interview. We're hoping all of the technical things work. Mr. Octor has been, what, oh, absolutely. This was an interview uh, that uh, was taken. They wanted to know what her five <coughs> favorite operas were. And there are some of you who have never heard an opera or are not interested, but it's just the manner in which she speaks about them that is, I think, very important as to who she is. Bravo, Bravo, sir. If you can't hear her, at least you can see what she's saying. The marriage of Hebrew, which is about to open as a lyric. But on some days, my answer would be Don Giovanni. It's a toss up between those. You need to put your microphone up. Can we do that? Yeah. Just the right. Move me. Isn't that odd? And number three is not necessarily my favorite opera, but it's close. But it's the part that and I she speaks so. And that part is the Marshall Lane. I know. I would prefer to go to the dramatic show. As between Verdi's Otello and Shakespeare's Othello, the opera is to be. Her comments next are the. Puccini wrote an opera, The Girl of the Golden West, Antula, where Minnie <coughs> saves her man from the gallows. <laughs> she plays cards with the sheriff to decide if she wins, she saves her man. If she loses, well, it's not going to be so good for Minnie <laughs> or her man. <laughs> but Minnie is a very strong woman. Do I have to do anything to stop it? Okay. 
I want you to hear. You're finally. I want you to hear the aria that she's talking about. Minnie is in the West, Golden Girl of the West, and she owns a saloon, which is highly unusual for women back then. And this man is in love with her, and uh, he wants her to go with him and give up the saloon. And she says, oh, no, I am strong. I own this saloon, and I'm staying here. And the, the aria is by this woman who has an incredible voice. And I would like you to hear just part of it, and then we can get into the discussion. But I thought it was important that you hear her favorite choices and that the one that is her most favorite is because it has this strong woman, this woman who doesn't die of consumption or, or whatever, jump off as in Tosca and, and all of that. So Robert, I'm depending upon you to... There it is. The reason I wanted you to hear that is because, well, Puccini, first of all, my Lord have mercy, but, um, but the fact that the sound is just very simple, in a sense, and very beautiful. And she, when she speaks, it's very metered, very p simple, but very dynamic. And so, I would like this to be a conversation. I know it sounds like I'm standing up in front of a class. I don't mean to do that. It's part of my DNA, I guess, to a certain point. But I really want us to engage in a conversation. So when I mention something and I'll say, does someone have a comment about that? Uh, feel free, but also may I take the liberty of saying thank you very much uh, in terms of maybe stopping a, a little bit too long. First of all, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is 84 years old, doing a remarkable job at just as a jurist. And she was known as Kiki when she was a little girl. For those of you who have read the book or know very much about her, I'm going to sort of read from a timeline in a sense, and then I'm going to go to some of the um, uh, briefs that she wrote, and um, remarkably so. She enrolled in Cornell in 1950, but she was born in 1933. We've done the math on that. Um, she married her husband, Marty, the love of her life, in 54. And she enrolled in Harvard in 56 and was one out of nine women in the entire law school. Okay. She transferred to Columbia, and she was the, the top of her class. And in 1963, she was the second woman on faculty at Rutgers University. And the dean said, well, you know, we're not going to pay you as much as we do the men, 
Because you're married, first of all, and second of all, your husband makes a good living. We could make a lot of comments about that because, in fact, even in this day and age, is it not so, that this takes place in many places that we know about. Is there anybody who uh, would like to speak, uh, say briefly, on a situation that they know, uh, even today, where that takes place? Does anybody? Diana, if you would be. Wait, wait, wait. wait. No. The last job I had, had for 10 years before I retired. Um, I was a lending officer for a group of people who um, made loans to um, farmers, horse farms, rural properties. And because I was lending officer, I was bound by confidentiality not to speak about what other people make. I got to see what, and everyone that worked with me, there were 40 people in our group, and I probably refinanced the homes of 15 of them at least. They all came to me for refinances or to purchase new homes. All the men made 25% more than I made, and I worked long, long hours. I worked circles around the mall. I did get raises, I did get good reviews, but I never made what those people made that sat around telling stories with their farmers for five hours out of every eight hour day. Never made it. What was the year? I retired in 2015. Oh God. This is recent. Mm -hmm. This yep. is still going on. Thank you very much. Um, yes, please. Um, yes, Anne. I don't know what the statistics are exactly, but it's still a gap between men's women Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, this happened, and uh, I'm not going to mention any names. Thank you, uh, Lita. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, when I uh, divorced my first husband, uh, we had a uh, joint. It was legal. We had the same lawyer, blah, blah, split even down the middle. And through the years, we had both put money in a joint um, tax-free account that uh, we had. So uh, part of the deal was I got my half of it. And uh, in the meanwhile, uh, I had divorced him and uh, was uh, engaged to another man. And uh, the first husband decided, well, he wasn't going to pay me my half of the money and uh, or sign it over because after all, I didn't need it because I had another man in line to take care of me. So I had to take him to court, um, and it was before a lady judge, and uh, she laughed her uh, gown off and uh, said, no way, Jose. Actually, she didn't. She didn't speak Spanish. She was from uh, Winchester. But uh, anyway, uh, she, uh, I won, and then he had to pay all the legal fees. So. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Woo woo. <laughs> I'm going to continue on. Um, in 1970, she taught her first class on women and the law. And there's a picture in the book that's just remarkable. And I guess I could have scanned some and all of that, but I, I didn't do that. But in 1971, she wrote her first brief to the Supreme Court, Read versus Read which the Supreme Court said in 1971, outlaws sex discrimination. And it was actually a man who said, I have to take care of my sick spouse, and I need equal whatever he was going to get to help take care of her, because somehow or another, they never thought it would be the man. It would always be the woman. And so Reed versus Reed is a very remarkable um, decision by the Supreme Court, gender discrimination, 
and it harmed everybody. It just wasn't the female. And what's remarkable about Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a lot of her um, uh, conclusions are, influ are about men, actually, almost more than about women, per se. So she's colorblind, if you'll pardon the expression, about who, quote, she sees in the briefs. It's the issue. It's not the people per se. It's the equality that she wants to see happen. Um, in 1972, she became the first female tenured professor at Columbia. Marvelous. And then in, nine, and then, uh, in about, I never can remember the date, so you'll have to excuse me for thumbing for just a minute. The Women's Rights Group through the ACLU, marvelous. All of a sudden, there was a group of women who said, hey, we're going to be doing this. She co-founded that. And um, the Women's Rights Project. And I want to read something to you, if I might. I don't have a good memory for memorizing things, so I read. Her fellow feminists on fire to transform the world sometimes had to be persuaded to see things her way. Quote, she insisted that we attempt to develop the law one step at a time. This is part of her modus operandi. She is not, let's get it done quickly. It's very meticulous, very slow to some people, and yet on the other hand, she wants to make sure it doesn't hurry up and happen too fast. And when we get to Roe versus Wade, I'll make a comment about that. To continue, her fellow ACLU lawyer, Kathleen Piratis, later said, quote, present the court with the next logical step, she urged us, and then the next, and then the next. Don't ask them to go too far too fast, or you'll lose what you might have won. She often said, it's not time for that case. We usually followed her advice, and when we didn't, we invariably lost. Marvelous. I mean, that almost says it right there. Um, 1973, Roe versus Wade. Absolute. She felt that, she, well, she was uneasy, was the word, how quickly the court got there. That's always been her, even the way she speaks, it's so metered, very aware and conscious of what she's saying. I mean, just remarkable to me, because if I can make a parenthetical personally, I'm usually, blah, 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 blah. you know, I'm, I'm going, I'm going fast. Very hard to have step back and have patience and think about what's coming next. I think that's a, a lesson for us all. I'd like to stop for a minute and look at the UU principles. If there was a Unitarian in this world, she's it, as far as I'm concerned. And I know you know what they are, but I'd like to read them, if I might. One, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. That's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Justice, equality, and compassion, equity, sorry, and compassion in human relations. Acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, the right of conscience, the use of democratic process within our congregations and in society at large, the goal of the world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, and finally, seven, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. I mean, that's... RBD in a nutshell, uh, and it just is remarkable to me how she continues to do that. She said if it hadn't been for President Carter, it might, there might not be as many women on the Supreme Court now as they are because he nominated her for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit Court. And that started her parade, as it were, 
or her steps to the Supreme Court. And then there's sort of a gap for her in that she worked. Sandra Day O'Connor came on the scene, marvelous, okay? And then in 1993, President Clinton nominated RBG as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. And then in 1996, there was a major opinion, which she wrote, Equal Protection, 14th Amendment, United States versus Virginia Military Institute. Women are allowed to be part of that. I won't say let in, but allowed to be part of that. Then in 1999, an unfortunate thing happened. She had cancer her first bout with cancer. <laughs> if I remember correctly, and somebody do cor correct me if I'm incorrect on this, within the week that they diagnosed and she started treatments, she was back on the bench. That woman is beyond indomitable, just quite remarkable. Even the picture of her, I mean, there's, there's nothing to her practically, physically, but oh man. All right, then we had 2000, Bush versus Gore. Her quote, the wisdom of the court's decision to intervene and the wisdom of its ultimate determination awaits history's judgment. She didn't go, you know, what the heck is happening and who are these people? Meet her again, very careful, of the words she chooses. It's, she's remarkable in that regard. 2007, if I might, I'd like to turn to the pages just so I don't miss anything. Aha. Uh -huh. She dissented from Gonzalez versus Carhartt. She summarized her dissent from the bench. That was almost like, excuse me, and I beg your pardon, we don't do that here. Not with RBG. It's just, oh, it's almost going to be a political statement. When Gorsuch, Gorsuch got on the Supreme Court recently, and he started giving the whole court a history lesson in what the Constitution was all about. I hope I'm not insulting anybody. And it looked like she was, I, I'm sure you all read this, kind of like she was, you know, how she does. She kind of looks like she's fallen asleep. Uh-uh. All of a sudden, she lifted up her head and said, one, man, one person, one vote. In other words, what happened to that? And he, <laughs> sorry, he just got quiet. She is always there. Well, maybe the time when, uh, Obama did his State of the Union and all the ju judges were sitting there and she was kind of, you know, she said, to, she, you know, maybe she just had, you know, had, had, had indulged a, a bit much, and be, needless to say. But her dissent, the quote was, the court pretends that its decision protects women. Uh-uh equal across the board. It's just, just. And then when Obama became president and, you know, they play basketball and he's pretty, pretty darn good. And I'm, I'm sure you've heard this quote. And he says, I don't know. He said, I, I hear um, Justice uh, Ginsburg has a heck of a jump shot. I mean, you know, he's talking. <laughs> just wonderful, wonderful quote, wonderful quote. And then in 2013, um, I don't know if, if uh, some couples in here want to make a comment about this one, but um, I'm sorry. Yes, 2013, United States versus Windsor. Would anybody like to make a comment about that, or shall I say a little bit more before you do? There's full marriage, and then there's sort of skim milk marriage. Do you love it or what? <laughs> Isn't she? 
successful challenge to the Defense of Marriage Act. Absolutely, categorically. And then in 2013, I know this is out of stones, I'm just giving you these, but, but they're marvelous. We, um, we need to be refreshed, if I might say it that way. She dissented in a case gutting the Voting Rights Act. I mean, and, and hmm, I want to say something, but I can't or shouldn't. Okay? It's okay. When she's sitting there, she has two collars. I know I'm, for those of you that speak French, it's J O B O T, Jabot, or is it T pronounced? I'm not sure. I should have looked that up. I beg you, French is my worst. She wears a lacy collar. So now you have to, for those of you that don't know, if it's, she dissents, she wears the glass beaded velvet. The Banana Republic made that. If she agrees, she wears the gold trim and charms. <laughs> so before you even know what's going to happen, you need to take a look at her and see what she is wearing. I just think it's... Oh, my word. Oh, absolutely. Well, then, of course, I was going to bring a ball. Her workouts. Can we end on a sort of, well, we won't end totally. I have some quotes I'd like to read to you. In the newspaper, and his book is out now, the fellow who, and he helps also Kagan and uh, Sotomayor. And um, her workout, she has a ball, and he, she throws it, and he throws it, and she does push-ups. I mean, she's quite a remarkable woman because she's had two cancer scares, I do believe. And so her workout is simply wonderful. But I would like to read some quotes from her, if I might. Hold on, just, oh, this is the last thing I will do. Okay. This is an article uh, that I got from the New York Times and Linda Greenhouse. If you have never read Linda Greenhouse, oh my gosh, you need to read this woman. She, remarkable, Linda Greenhouse. Just, she was a court reporter for the Supreme Court for 20 something years at least quite a remarkable woman in, in her own right. And she uh, wrote this as a contributing op-ed writer, opinion pages for the New York Times. Um, it was January, February, March, April, May, June. It was uh, June or July 2017. That's okay. Absolutely. She said, I had met Judge Ginsburg several times but didn't know her well. I found her Judiciary Committee testimony enlightening, and I wrote an analysis that appeared under the headline, A Sense of Judicial Limits. I described her as, quote, something of a rare creature in modern judicial lexicon, a judicial restraint liberal. Isn't that a great phrase? Yeah. I love it because you, some people think ju liberals fall off the cliff practically when they're speaking, and, and, and she isn't. And she says, by that I meant that while her own commitments were to liberal outcomes, she displayed an equally strong commitment to letting Congress take the lead. Quote, in her view, equality or any goal is best achieved if all branches of government have a stake in achieving it. I think it's a remarkable observation on greenhouses. Quote, Give me just a second to make sure that I'm... I want to read about a quote, uh, capital punishment. The incidence of capital punishment has gone down, 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 so that now I think there are only three states that actually administer the death penalty, she said. We may see an end to capital punishment by attrition as there are fewer and fewer executions. And of course we could debate that and then some. And to, I mean, there's, okay, let me show you the book I have. It's 
It's marvelous. I mean, it's got everything in it but the kitchen sink. And, and I'd, I'd like to, if I might conclude, and I hope it isn't too short, but I would like to conclude with how to be like RBG. Work for what you believe in. Pick your battles. Don't burn your bridges. Don't be afraid to take charge. Think about what you want, then do the work. But then enjoy what makes you happy. Bring along your crew. Have a sense of humor. I think that applies, doesn't it? She's a Unitarian at heart, I do, I do believe. <laughs> Even though we're both of a different. <clears throat> So, I thought that I wouldn't get too down and dirty, but I give you an overview of her. I don't get any compensation for telling you you need to buy the book. Um, it's quite remarkable. I have one more thing, if I might. And maybe I've already done that. Aha. Uh -huh. And I'd like to read this uh, paragraph, if I might. Legacy is a topic RBG won't linger on because it has a note of finality. But she will take stock. I think this is everybody. In my life, what I find most satisfying is that I was a part of a movement that made life better, not just for women, RBG says. I think gender discrimination is bad for everyone. It's bad for men. It's bad for children. Having the opportunity to be part of that change is tremendously satisfying. Think of how the Constitution begins. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, but we're still striving for the more perfect union. And one of the perfections is that for we, the people, to include an ever enlarged group. This expansion has been RBG's life work, and it's not over yet. That's it. Thank you so much.